Welcome to this mini course about engaging circle time strategies. My name is Samia and I want to thank you for joining us and being part of this mini course and more importantly for being a lifelong learner. Today we will share some of the best practices. We're going to talk about how we can engage children during circle time. We're also going to be showing you some examples in form of videos of teachers doing different kind of approaches to circle time. And we're going to be looking at it from a different angle because instead of telling you what is best um, or what is better or which approach is better and which isn't, we're going to invite you to reflect on the differences that we present to you today so that you can critically examine the pros and cons of these approaches and then make up your own mind for what you think is the most appropriate for your own children in your own community. So let's get started. Historically, you'll be you'll, you won't be surprised that 92% of us uh, as teachers, we use circle time as a strategy to help manage our classrooms. We might call it community time, we might call it gathering time, and you might be surprised that it actually started in the 1800s. And today it continues to be an activity to help children learn about individuality and also their community. If you've been studying uh, child development, you might heard, you might have heard about the German educator no, named Frederick Frobel. He was born in 21st of April in 1782, and he is documented um, or researched to be uh, have create, come up with the term kindergarten. He believed that play was the highest expression of human development in childhood, and he thought that it was the only way that children could express what was truly in their, in their soul. And according to Frobel, the purpose of circle time is that so that children get a chance to voice out their demands and wishes. Now keep, this, keep these different approaches in mind when, when we show you the videos towards the end of this mini course. So what Frobel uh, believed was that it's actually not the time for teachers to speak or ask questions rather than it's the children's time to voice out their demands and their wishes. Let's look at an, another famous um, uh, specialist in, or psychologist in child development. You've also probably heard about Maslow, Abraham Maslow, and you've probably are familiar with the Maslow's hierarchy of needs in children's development. So you know that it starts with the physiological needs at the bottom, and then as children have those, they move towards achieving the top part of the, the hierarchy. And what Maslow believed the circle time was to be able to build children's esteem. And he actually identified two categories within the esteem stage. He talked about the esteem for oneself or self-esteem and esteem that you build as a reflection from others. So self-esteem and esteem from others. So you can start to kind of visualize the importance of circle time is, is where you, you build your own understanding about yourself, but also you build your understanding about yourself as you reflect off of the perceptions that others are having within that community time. So in a sense, really, a lot of people call it the magic circle because it helps children learn about not only their individuality, but how they connect um, within the community itself. And of course, typically we know that it's for groups of five children or more. Usually you're spending about 20 minutes focusing on something new or something common, like a common human experience. But regardless, we know that the main goal is to foster that self-awareness and to develop the skills of being able to share information with each other respectfully and, and um, authentically, and also to really listen, to actively listen to each other's feelings. And as you are probably joining us from all over the world, circle time practices are documented in research around the world. 
in the United States, where I am right now, Canada, New Zealand, Sweden, Sweden, Finland, there's so much research that talks about how circle time practices are um, implemented differently across different structures. And that's why in the mini course today, I just want you to be so open to looking at um, these different approaches and really reflecting on and choosing what is best for your own self. The circle time, when we talk to most teachers, circle time is evolved into something very different. Um, usually we talk about the weather, you know, we talk about, we take attendance during circle time, especially if you're doing it first time in the morning, um, you're sharing information, you might be reading a book aloud, uh, that may be the time where you're assigning classroom responsibilities, a task you're giving children tasks to do around the classroom, or you're just having general conversations. And we want to, what we want to do right now is we're going to deconstruct this a little bit more and dive into what is actually happening during circle time and and is it is it really appropriate? Do we we really do we really need circle time at all? What are the pros and cons of circle time? And are teachers actually supposed to organize or do circle time at all? So some scholars have talked about the actually the disadvantages or the cons of using circle time. And especially with related to uh, calendar work um, and how that is connected to behavioral issues. And so let's talk about that some more. So, you probably know or have done calendar work. This is very common in, in many uh, uh, early childhood classrooms. Calendar work during circle time would be probably um, you talking about days of the week, right? Units of time, past, future. Uh, you're talking about weekend versus weekday. Um, and this is very common and um, a, a lot of us start the day like this. However, research has also shown us that children under the age of five are unable to use calendars to understand the relationship between past and future. Um, this is, it's not related to their education, it's related to their brain development. So if you've talked to a children, talk to a child and promise them you know, uh, to take them somewhere or do a particular activity. And then maybe you've said to a child, yes, we'll do that in two days or tomorrow or after one hour. All they hear is now and not now, right? So this might be very familiar to you. And that's because of their, uh, their, their development. So think about it when you're doing calendar work or any other kind of work that they're not developmentally prepared for, you know, um, are we, are we go, are we implementing an activity that is beyond the ability of their developmental brain? And then if you actually do see children responding, um, or um, if they are, if they are actually engaging with that kind of calendar work, then ask yourself, is it possible that the children are imitating and modeling or are they actually learning? Now, I know you might say to yourself that imitation and modeling is part of child development. That's how they, especially in their drama uh, act center, right? That's how they learn is when they imitate and model things. And I think that you would have a very solid argument. Whereas we are trying to deconstruct um, the routineness of doing calendar work during circle time. And I'm challenging you to reflect on whether having it as a routine rather than a play-based activity, but having it and implementing it or enforcing it as a routine, whether or not that is developmentally appropriate. And that is the question for you to, to consider. So really, the research done by Harris in the year 2000, they found that children's disengagement at circle time, it actually increases when the activities are developmentally inappropriate. So that imbalance of doing appropriate practice can lead to higher disruptive behavior. And actually, calendar routines were one of the three activities that were associated with the highest levels 
of challenging behavior. And please keep in mind when we're presenting this kind of research, it does not mean that it's a rule. It does not mean that it applies to all. It's only meant to be presented to you so that you can reflect at a situation uh, at hand. So we talked about calendar work um, and choosing developmentally appropriate activities. So let's talk about the length of circle time. Let's look at the length of, of the time that you spend um, during this circle time. Some people will find that 15 minutes is enough. Other people will spend 40 minutes doing circle time um, and focused on more of like calendar activities, rote memorization, class rules. And you want to really be mindful that only um, the, that a research done by Wiltz and Klein in 2001, they found that children who disliked circle time were associated with the classroom that did longer sessions of circle time. So then you also wanna keep in mind when you're strategizing for circle time, not only the developmental appropriateness, but also the length of the time that you're spending during circle time. Now let's talk about the structure. Should I stru structure it? Do we script or prescribe circle time? Do I leave it more child-led? Do I leave it more teacher-led? You know, what is the best option here? So let's let's take a look at the, the research um, and what it says. So you'll see the, the graph here in front of you, and you'll notice that it, set, it shows you uh, the child engagement. Okay, so you'll see right here, I'll use the, this arrow over here. So you'll see child engagement starts at 100%. So the first, the first minute or so, you're starting circle time, and 100% of children are there looking at you, they're engaged, right? And as time goes by, so there's two and a half minutes, there's five minutes, there's seven and a half minutes, the research has shown is that the longer time you spend in circle time, the less children are engaged. And if you're spending 20 minutes in circle time, then chances are that only 20% are actually engaged uh, at that time. So by the end of the circle time, the engagement has dropped to 20%. And then what they found also was that um, if you, it sh this bar shows the disengagement and how off task they are. So if you're wondering why children are showing signs of challenging behavior during circle time, you'll see that 50% of children were significantly disengaged if circle time um, was longer. And actually, if you already have children that are you know, suffering from challenging behavior, there's a lot of things maybe going on in their lives. And, and you know, actually spending more time in teacher-led circle time can increase uh, the noticeable negative interactions. So if you're doing teacher-led more routine, more structure in your circle time, more teacher-led activities, more, more kind of rules and calendar work, then if you're doing that kind of circle time, then after those, those approaches to circle time, there's an increase to an almost 25% or 22% increase in negative interactions or more challenging behavior. So let's review so far, we talked about the appropriateness, the developmental appropriateness of the activities. We talked about the length of the time. We talked about um, the structure, how much open-ended or how much teacher-led. And then let's also talk about the type of interactions um, that are happening. So when, you know, just reflect on your own self and, and what's really happening as if you're trying to watch your own self and observe yourself while, while, while you're interacting with children during circle time, you know, how much, how much are you speaking? How much are the children speaking? Uh, are the teaching, are, are the teachers speaking twice as much as children? You know, are they asking more close-ended questions? Close-ended question would have a specific, maybe uh, a, a short answer or a correct answer. Um, or are you spending more time having dynamic back and forth exchanges? Are you spending more time having open-ended questions that don't 
particularly have a correct answer, but just have um, a reflection or a deep um, co actual conversation um, with children. So you wanna also uh, engage in looking at the type of interactions that are, that are happening as well. So we talked a little bit about the negative um, or cons of circle time or what could happen during circle time, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have wonderful advantages as well. There are many developmental benefits that circle time can have on young children. So let's, let's take a look at some of the, the wonderful features or the great strategies that can be implemented during circle time. So those are in the first column. And then the second column here is the, shows the, the direct developmental gain uh, the, or the developmental benefits. And then you have some secondary developmental benefits. So let's, let's pick up a few and deconstruct it. So if you're spending more time in open-ended questions, then that has a direct effect on children's cognitive development. You're enhancing their critical thinking skills, their problem solving skills. So that's like the main developmental benefit. And then you have, of course, very close to the cognitive development, you're helping them develop language. You're building their vocabulary, their sentence structure. If you're having, if you're doing group activities during circle time, then you're really helping them develop that social and emotional development. Remember Abraham Maslow, we talked about how children develop their esteem as not only as they understand themselves, but they understand themselves as a reflection off of their interactions with the group. So that those group activities are actually very important for their self-esteem as well. You're, if, you're, if you're working to uh, talking about time, um, time to learn about each other. So if you're spending time to kind of encourage children to look at the other children, to listen to the other children, to get to know other children, to get to know their their differences, you know, information about each other. So all of that is part of the social emotional development and, and is really helping them develop that holistic character that, that is, is going to be the foundation that will, that will be needed to develop all those other skills, right? Skills beget skills. So you need all of these beautiful social emotional and cognitive skills in order to build on that and work on the math, science, language, reading. So all of these are the foundational that you need for to develop all those other ones. So we can see that with careful planning and, and also with open reflection and being just open to looking at yourself and observing yourself and then allowing, trusting yourself to as, as an expert in child development, trusting yourself to be able to choose the right balance there can be really wonderful outcomes of quality circle time. We can see that how it can help you build a sense of community in, this, in, the, in the classroom. And research has actually shown that when you do spend time in quality circle time, that children for the rest of the day will be calmer, they'll be happier, and they will have fewer behavioral issues and they will have um, higher self-esteem. So let's, a little bit talk about the planning. So throughout a circle time, different curriculum, there's a factor of planning, right? And as an early childhood teacher, surely you're, or if you're a manager um, joining in on this course, you know how important it is that you want to have some structure, right? Or you as the, you as the teacher yourself or your manager might ask you, okay, what is my, my, my plan for circle time? So it's normal to, um, and expected for you to have some kind of plan. So how do you plan it? So, so far we've seen as a maximum of 20 minutes or less more unstructured activities than structured ones, right? And then more activities that allow them to interact with each other. So anything including music, finger plays, movement, conversation, uh, book reading as a group, poetry, vocabulary, all of these are, are, are wonderful. And then, so let's talk about reading. So how do you, when you read a book, you know, um, it's not just about 
passive learning. Sometimes we're very concerned about, okay, I started the book and I have to get to the end of the book. I have to get to the last page, right? If you release that stress from yourself, if you release the having to, to go through it or complete it as a checklist and kind of you, you give into enjoying the moment and building their language, listening to each other, having conversations about things that you've learned, you will take it from the passive reading style to more a dynamic reading, more a, a dialogic reading, um, having dialogues with the children about what you're reading. And, and if you don't finish and come to the end of the, end the book, and that's, that's absolutely fine. You know, you had, you have, you've achieved something so much more important. And then let's talk about, um, sometimes teachers are always sharing ideas about how do I actually form a physical circle? You know, how do I, do they, do the children hold hands? Do I put carpet squares so the children know where to sit? Um, how do I, do I put stickers on the ground and, and do I put chairs? You might not have chairs, right? So even considering different creative ways on how to physically form that circle um, is, 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 is a place for you to think of all of these creative, creative ideas. So, and, and different approaches, as we'll see in a moment in these videos that I'm going to show you, different approaches like the Montessori approach or the EYFS approach or Reggio Emilia approach, they have different um, uh, strategies or understanding of, of, what, of what circle time is. So, for example, in the Montessori perspective, they have a very unique approach. Sometimes they call it line activities or they call it individual uh, and um, development focus. So you'll, you'll notice that um, according to the American Montessori uh, Association, they, they call it, they ref there's a reference to line activities um, in, in the teacher education program handbook, which is very similar to the circle, uh, circle time uh, activities as well. Um, they, they do have uh, whole group activities um, more than they, and they focus on that more than the academic achievement because that's, a, that's one of the core values of the Montessori's mission. Uh, and they really see the teacher having to be, not to be the center of attention, rather the facilitator of those, of those unique interactions. And then if we look at the EYFS, circle time in EYFS, I, there's, there's, a lot more reference of that label circle time in the EYFS. Um, and you'll find lots of strategies even on the, the internet where, where, you're, where you're looking at a lot more structure um, to when the teacher is speaking and then when there's a, a time for the children to be speaking. And there's actually a book called Circle Time for the Young um, by Margaret Collins. I think it's a great book, but um, and it's based on the EYFS. Um, so they talk about a, we, here's a copy of the the regular structure. So you'll notice that um, th this is how M Margaret Collins describes how an ideal circle time should take place. First, there's a welcome. So you go around the circle and you say hello to each child. Then there's teacher time where the teacher gets to set the theme of the session. Then there's children's time. Then there's the main theme of the session. Then there are songs. You, you can see that there's a lot more structure. And it's for you to decide whether which, which of these approaches is, is, is something that is appropriate for, for your own children. Okay, so next we have, um, we have I'm gonna show you three videos. Uh, the first one is a bit more structured uh, the second one is a little bit less structured. And then the third one is, is, has little or no structure to, to it at all, uh, at all. And then we will uh, reflect on them together. Here we go. Good morning. This is Shanna Wolfenden, the Assistant Director here at Children's Lighthouse, and we're in our young five-year-old classroom this morning with Miss Barbara. Her children are ready this morning for circle time, so we're going to just kind of sit back and watch and see how our young fives do 
Good morning, Circle. Good morning, class. Good morning, Miss Barbara. Let's sing our preschool song. Good morning, preschool friends. How are you? Good morning, preschool friends. How are you? It's time to start our day. We will work and learn and play. Good morning, preschool friends. How are you? Good job. What are we going to do first today? Let's do, let's count to 20 in Spanish. How about that? So you'll, you'll notice without even the reflection is that she, there was a lot of structure to that example. Um, they did do some calendar work and the children were very used to that routine. So they executed the routine very smoothly. Um, and, you know, it's a question to, uh, it's, it's for you to reflect um, and, and to see and examine what's happening. You know, those children seemed 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 engaged um, and but it is it is a question to to are they imitating are they learning um, and whether that is the best uh, approach or not it's not for me to say but it's for for you to reflect on so let's look at the next example it's a little bit less structured and we'll look at it together <laughs> Hello guys, so we will play a game today which we will tell our favorite color and then after you say, for example, my favorite color is green, you make a movement and then everybody repeats the movement you make. So I can start. My favorite color is green. Yes? Golden. Golden. What movement do you want to make? You can make a movement. Oh, nice! Who's next? My favorite color is golden. Everybody repeats. Very good. Say it. Pink. And? Very good. Yes? Pink. What movement? Wow, who can do that? I. Who can try to do that? I. Wow, can you try to do it? Good job, guys. Very good. Who's next? My favorite color is golden. Golden. What movement do you want to do? Who is next? And my favorite color is purple. And? So we saw in the second video that it was a little bit less structured. There was a plan. The teacher did have a plan, but the children didn't have, they did have a voice in it. They get to choose some things, choose what movements they wanted to do. And you notice that when the first child said golden, a lot of the other children also said golden. So you, that they did listen to each other. They were watching each other. They were modeling each other. So you'll see that they were, actively observing each other part of the group um, so that and then this is the third example this one is uh, from a regio a regio school and i'm going to skip to uh in the middle of the of the let's see because this all of the beginning is them welcoming the children and this is where they start circle time Okay, 
So what actually happened during that circle time, even though it wasn't um, in, in English, uh, that they used circle time to negotiate um, the activities that they wanted to do. So it wasn't, it's not, um, it's not a planned circle time where it, they call it the morning meeting. So in this morning meeting, the whole class, and you'll see that there were much more than five children. The morning meeting, all the children came together and they were organizing what the activities would be for the rest of the day. The children during this morning meeting were actually negotiating with the teacher. Uh, they were negotiating saying, who's gonna be their uh, group partner what activities they're going to do. And the children, actually the leader or whoever came up with the activities got to choose uh, the other classmates that they were, they were going to work with. Sono capaci di portarci il numero dei bimbi che ci sono a pranzo, il numero dei bambini che ci sono a letto. 25 e tu sei contata? 4, 5 e anche la vegna. So as you can see after their morning meeting or their version of circle time, they chose what they negotiated their activities, they chose their group partners, and then they went ahead and started working on their projects. So those are very different approaches to uh, circle time. And I hope that in today's session that we can see that, you know, we're all different people. And we have differences that we should love. And none of these examples are good or bad. They're different. And our goal here is to help you think and reflect and decide for your own and what is best for children in your, in your own community, community. Thank you very much uh, for joining this mini course. And next, it's time for the uh, final quiz and the certification.